Friends, if you have your Bibles with you, or I believe it's printed on the back of the bulletin, please open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 4, and this morning we're going to be looking at verses 26 to 34. Friends, let us pray. O oh, gracious God and Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful to be here together in your house. Said on the profession that he is Lord and is on that rock that he the church. And Lord, it is our desire to profess you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we, we come this morning to hear from you. And Lord, it is, we, we come into this time of, of the highest point of our worship, and that is when your word becomes the focal point of our worship. And so, Lord, we are here, all of us, to hear from you this morning. We need you, Lord. We come to you this morning, Lord, because our lives do not work without you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts this morning, that your word would go ever deeper into our being so that we may be the people that you are calling us. Created us to be back before the foundation of the world, the way you thought about us, you thought about your church. So, Lord, show us the way. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, I'm going to ask you uh, to stand for the reading of God's word. Mark 4. Uh, verses 26 to 34. And he said, The kingdom of God is as, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shape. With many such parables, he spoke of the word to them as they were able to hear it. Did not speak to them with their parables, but privately to his own disciples. This is the word of the Lord. So, in an attempt to, to sort of move through it this morning, we'll just let's try and get right at it. Chapter 4, as we've been saying, has, has brought us into this section of parables, parables that Jesus uses to help us understand the kingdom of God. Right? The kingdom of God to sinful humanity is a foreign place. Right? We need to understand that. The kingdom of God to sinful humanity is a mystery. And so Jesus teaches in parables to help us understand, actually to help those who have ears to hear, understand the nature of the kingdom of God. And friends, we need to understand the kingdom of God. We need to understand that it is a mystery. We need to understand that it is like a foreign land to the hearts of sinful people. Like sin, friends, sin has made God's kingdom foreign. It has created it to be a mystery. In the Garden of Eden, Before the Garden of Eden, God created the heavens and the earth. And he made the earth. And he made a garden within Eden. And he made it as a sanctuary. A sanctuary where people, human beings, humanity, could dwell in the presence of God. Heaven and earth were joined. They were one. 
God and man live together. But then man decided. We decided. Let's own it. We got to own it. We decided that we, that we knew better than God over the world. And so sin entered the world and it separated heaven and earth. And the moment that heaven and earth was separated and man and God could no longer dwell together, the kingdom of God became a mystery to man. We have to understand the story this way. The kingdom of God is a mystery. Sin has made the kingdom a mystery. We have made the kingdom a mystery. Our corrupt hearts have made the kingdom of God a mystery. Psalm 11, the psalmist reminds us the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked. And the one who loves violence will let him bring coals on the wicked, the psalmist says. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their power. This is what is really sinful man. The throne of God is in what is due to sinful man is fire and sulfur and a scorching wind. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall be cold to his face. God's kingdom, friends, is shrouded by a veil, so we need Jesus to be the revelation of God's kingdom. That's who Jesus is. He is the revelation of God's kingdom. He came to earth to reveal this grand mystery to us. This grand mystery where, on one hand, says God hates the wicked. God hates sin so much that he will rain cold down. Hot, burning cold down on the wicked. And yet, somehow, the upright will behold the face of God. This is, friends, the mystery. Who is upright? No one is upright. No one of us can claim to be upright. No one is righteous. So how is it possible that anyone will see God's face? Everywhere we turn, friends, we need to understand that we are confronted by the mystery only in Jesus that this mystery is revealed to those who the, who, who the gospel writer says has ears to hear. And so friends, the question that we ask ourselves this morning is, do we have ears to hear? Let us hear Jesus. Let that be the prayer of our hearts. Jesus, give us ears to hear. Let the soil of our hearts be good soil, where the seed is planted and it grows and it flourishes and it produces a harvest. Let that, friends, be the prayer of our hearts. And I, I was, the other day I was singing the, the hymn, How Deep the Father is Love for Us. And, and I started reflecting on the words, why should I wait for I cannot give an answer, but this I know of all my heart. The wounds have pained my heart. This is the mystery that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Friend, all the glory of God and pain in the person of Jesus Christ so that he could dwell among us and invite those who he has chosen to partake in his grand banquet. All the glory, all the glory of God in Jesus Christ, contained in the person of Jesus Christ. 
so that he could come forward, so that he could invite us personally. A personal invitation. Do you realize that? This is not just, this isn't a form letter. Jesus doesn't come and, and start spreading out fire. As it's some sort of form letter. Yeah, it comes, if you know, if you're in Christ. Jesus comes and individually invites us to the kingdom of heaven. He personally invites us to the kingdom of heaven. He comes to each and every single one of us whom he has chosen, and he invites us into his glorious kingdom. He invites us to come and partake at his banquet table. He comes to come sit, eat with me. All the divine glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ came to earth to invite each and every one. The cross, friends, is an invitation. All the glory. And I want to unpack that a little bit because it was it was the topic of conversation I know for at least one of our small groups on Thursday. And it's and we have to understand this a little bit. We have to understand the glory of God. The glory of God can't just be a concept to us. It can't just be, oh, yeah, the glory of God. Right? Jesus is God. He's God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The whole universe, friends, was made through Jesus. Amen. Nothing was made that has been made. Right? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Nothing has been made that was made. The whole cosmos, all of creation, everything that we understand, and more that we don't understand, was created through Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is holy. God is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is not defiled in any way. Friends, and we also know that God is without form. That's, that's why, how, what's the second commandment? You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Friends, God is beyond the comprehension of our puny little brains. We can't comprehend God. And yet, what is equally true is that God wants to reveal himself to us. Wow. Right? That should blow our minds. That our minds, we can't comprehend God, and yet he wants to reveal himself to us. And he wants to do it. He wants to do it so that we, his creation, can know how loved we are. Friends, we are nothing without God's love. I don't know if you really realize this. So many of us go through life looking for love. But the truth of the matter is, is all the worldly love, it doesn't add up to the fact that without God's love, we are nothing. We will never be whole without God's love. God wants to reveal himself to us for the simple reason that we can know. That we're loved. That we were made by a creator out of love. That we are not an accident. No, no matter what our life 
circumstances are, we are not an accident. We are lost because we are not that He wants to reveal himself to us so that we can know that. But we, we have a dilemma. <laughs> we, we have a dilemma. We can't really comprehend God, and yet His desire is to be known by us. And friends, this is the starting place of grace. We've got to get that. This is the starting place of grace. We can't comprehend God, and yet God wants to reveal Himself to us so that we can know we're loved. This is the starting place of grace. So God, and we see it in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, begins presenting Himself to humanity in ways that humanity can comprehend it. Right? And all through the Old Testament, right? In, in the book of Exodus, we see God guiding his people in a pillar of fire and a pillar of sin. All through the Old Testament, in Genesis 15, we see God reveal to Abraham as a smoking fire. I don't get that, but, you know, with the whole life and everything. But God revealing himself in ways that make sense to people. That God, whom we cannot comprehend, is revealing himself to us in ways that we can comprehend. And he, he often sees these revelations of God. They are ways of God presenting himself to humans so that we can understand so that the full weight of his glory doesn't come down on us to kill us. Because that's what happens, friends, when the full weight of God's glory is when the full weight of glory, if it were ever to descend on our sinful humanity, it will destroy us. We're going to see that in Exodus, when Moses goes up the mountain. Right, what does Moses say to God? He says, God, I want to see you. He says, God, I want to behold your glory. God says, do you really know what you're asking of me? Do you know what you're asking? Yeah, Moses says, yeah, I want to see you. You and I, we're getting along pretty good here. You know, it took me a while. But look. Look at this. God says, you can't. You can't. The best you can do is see like the hem of my garment. I'm going to you come off, but I'm going to put you in a crevice in the rock. I'm going to cover your face. And then I'm going to pass by, and just at the very last second, I'm going to make a little crack so that you can just get a little good. Because that's all you can handle. And even then, I'm going to turn the volume down. And what happens? Moses comes down from the mountain, he's like, shh, shh, Then he has to put a veil over his face. So what happens? The glory of God doesn't destroy everybody else. Glory, God's glory. It's hard for us to understand, but we have to comprehend it. We have to understand it. It's not a tangible thing. You can't hold or touch God's glory, but it doesn't make it any less real. And so we have to start, we have to figure out a way of thinking about God's glory. Because God's glory, most of us think about God's glory as sort of some sort of a blinding light. Right? And, and there is an element to that, but we have to understand God's glory in terms of it is a weight and it's an intensity of God's holiness, His purity, His perfection, and His love. It's a weight and it's an intensity. The glory of God is a weight and it's an intensity. And it is so heavy and it is so intense that if anything even remotely less Slightly less holy and pure and perfect and loving were to come in, in contact with it at all, it'll kill them. Right? And, that's, and that's what God was saying. And that's why God says, Moses, I'm going to hide you a little bit. Well, I've got to hide you a lot. And we need to understand glory as a unit of measurement of weight and intensity. Think of God. 
God's glory as the weight of a skyscraper and the intensity of the sun combined. It's not just a blinding light. It's a weight that crushes. No one can stand the weight, the crushing weight of God's glory, because it is a measurement of his holiness, righteousness, his purity, and his love. When that comes to bear on anything sinful, anything but slightly less pure, anything slightly less loving, anything slightly less holy and righteous, it will crush them. Only God Himself can bear the weight of His glory. And what happens if you look at the sun? You go blind. What happens if you get too close to the sun? You get burned up. And we don't even have to be as close as we are to the sun now, and it's a long ways away to get crushed by the way of God. This is how we have to understand glory, so we can understand Jesus. How could Jesus bear the weight of God's glory? God that we cannot comprehend and yet wants to reveal himself to us. And so he does so in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what Paul's saying to the, to, the, to the Colossian church. He is the visible image of the invisible God. This is how you have to know and understand Jesus. He is all of the glory of God in the person of of Jesus Christ, the, the writer of Hebrews says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is who Jesus is. This is who, how we must know Jesus. All of the glory of God, all of the weight, all of the blinding intensity are combined in Jesus. That's who he is. is the truth of Christ. And it is only Jesus then, who is the fullness of the glory of God, who can then reveal the kingdom of God to broken, sinful humanity without killing us, without crushing us under the weight of God's glory. And so friends, that's where we jump in today, talking about the inevitability of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is, is, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Jesus begins the parable, the kingdom of God is as if. In verse 30 he says, what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use? One of the things that I hope we know is that the kingdom of God cannot be understood simply in tidy little bullet points. Right? The kingdom of God is not a bumper sticker. The kingdom of God must be understood in big terms, not in bullet points, not on bumper stickers. You cannot know the kingdom of God by going on Twitter. Friends, that's why Jesus says the kingdom of God is life. Or what can we compare the kingdom of God to? I mean, he's saying that you have to think about and you have to contemplate about big things when we talk about the kingdom of God. Not little things. Not minute, tiny little things. 
You have to contemplate deeply in your heart. You have to contemplate and think deeply within you the kingdom of God if you want to know the kingdom of God. If you are going to ever understand it the way you are supposed to, the way you are meant to, the way only my people can, you have to take the things that are saying deep within your heart. Right? We've been talking about it. Uh, the difference between simple head knowledge of Jesus and knowing Jesus deep in our heart. Only one uh, type of these knowing leads to transformational change. Right? If only one of these types of knowing leads, leads to true conversion. Only one of these types of knowing leads to life change. Only one of these types of knowing leads to a deeper desire to meditate deeply on all of the things of the kingdom of God. Friends, one of the one of the symptoms of head knowledge is the fact that you need to tell everybody what simply what you know. Right? And, and as I said, with, with social media nowadays, this is what we see, people expounding on this head knowledge. Right, all over the place, all over every platform. One of the ways that you know if someone's heart has been changed, if they have taken the kingdom deep within their being, is their desire now is to see other people transform into the likeness of Jesus. And to be in a community of people that are growing together, that are inviting others into that community so that they can be Right? Most people nowadays, they spend most of their time on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram than they do with the community of the same. Jesus said, if you want to know me in my kingdom, you have to want it more than anything else in your life. So I said, if you have ears to hear, let, let them hear. He who has ears, let them hear. The point of the parables is that you have to want Jesus. You have to want him. You have to work out parables. You have to desire to know the truth. Because what does Jesus say about the truth? Exactly, it will set you free. To the degree you want him. To the degree that you want Jesus, what is what is what did we say last week? To the degree that you want Jesus, more will be added to you. But if you don't want it that much, everything you have will be taken away. This is the context that Jesus is speaking into, and he said, "The kingdom of God is as if a man." Had scattered seed on the ground and seeds and rice and day and night the seed sprouts and grows and he knows not how. The earth produces by itself for the blaze in the ear, there's a full grain in the ear, but when the grain is ripe at once he puts the sickle. Uh, he puts it into the sickle because it is the harvest time. There's two points from this first part of the text that I want to make. The first point is that the kingdom of God Though it may seem imperceptible at times, the kingdom of God is in everything. The second point is that when the kingdom has come, everyone will be harvested as such. Jesus goes back to the seed metaphors. Right? But unlike the first parable that was about the word being sown as the subject of the text, this time the point of the parable is, is the actual inevitability of the outcome of the seed that has been sown. Jesus is saying <clears throat> that the kingdom of God is growing. It's growing all around you, even if it doesn't, if it doesn't seem, if you don't, even if you don't see it growing, or think you see it growing, or even if you don't understand how it grows, it is growing. It is inevitable. The kingdom of God will prevail against everything. The kingdom of God is inevitable. And it's not growing because the sower made it grow. It's growing because some other force is acting on it. 
Right? We have to remember that this is about the kingdom of God and what God is doing. Right? What is the Bible about? It's about God. It's not about us. So often, too often, we read the Bible and we think the Bible's about us. We think God wrote a book about us, but he didn't. He wrote a book about himself. He wrote a book about how he is redeeming us from the mess that we made. Because that's what we did. We made a mess. The Bible is about God. And so so this parable is about what God is doing to grow the kingdom. This parable is about what God is doing to bring about the inevitability of his kingdom. It's here. It, it, <clears throat> it was inaugurated at the first coming of Jesus and will come to completion when he comes again. And in, the, in this time in between, it is growing. And God is doing the growing and he's coming back to do the harvest. And when he comes back to do the harvest, he will put the sickle to all of us. All of us will stand before him in judgment. <clears throat> when we read the Bible, if we think <clears throat> if we think this is about us, then we read this and, and we we understand or we think that the seed is like a, a worldly quest for power and attention. Right? That that, that, that seeks at all costs to secure our hold on. Right? That's religion. That's religion. We do a whole bunch of things that we think will please God, and then we give them our scorecards. Right? We give them our scorecards and go, hey, God, look! Guess what? I was good. You owe me! But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the gospel is not religion. Stop being religious. Because I don't care how many good things you do, you'll never be as good. You'll never be good enough. Because my standard is me. The weight of holiness, righteousness, purity, love. No matter how good we think we can be, we will never be that. Reveal myself to you because I want you to know that I love you. And so I'm sending you my son. I'm sending you my son, and even though you may not see my kingdom growing all around you, he is my son. I gave him so that you can get off the treadmill of religion. Get over yourself, God says. Do you know how much arrogance it takes to be religious? It is completely arrogant. He says, you don't have to be arrogant. Stop it. Be humble. And as a matter of fact, this one is more humble than other than you. He flourished. I was thinking, I know, I was thinking this week about the sea. And you know we're coming in with the and the leaves, you know, we drive around and the leaves have already started to change. And I don't know if you know, as most people do, it's the color of the bricks and the dark But I was thinking about the seeds in the I was thinking about the seeds, they're, they're called keys, right? They have that little thing there. I don't know if you have ever watched a maple seed what it is like. Right? It's just, it's it's peaceful. It's graceful. Right? And it, and it just it spins ever so gently to the ground. Right? There's, <clears throat> there's nothing particularly special about any individual maple seed because the tree produces thousands of them. Thousands of them. Right? And so there's nothing particularly 
threshold of any one of us. It's just graceful and peaceful and insignificant. And yet, <clears throat> realize that one single maple has the ability to populate a whole forest. And it's because when it's planted into good ground, it produces a maple tree. And that maple tree then produces thousands of more peace that will just peacefully insignificantly flutter to the ground. And the ones that produce or find the soil will produce many, many more trees, which will then in turn produce millions more maple trees. <coughs> This is my question, how the kingdom of God grows. Jesus uses the, the seed to show us that the kingdom of God doesn't come with swords and armies. It comes in the lives of, of us. Insignificant. Not graceful. <laughs> and yet, plants his seed, the word of God, in, in our hearts, trusting that it's going to grow, that it'll produce fruit, which will then go out into the world and plant the word of God into other hearts. This is how the kingdom of God grows. And sometimes it's imperceptible. And sometimes it looks ugly. But this is how the kingdom of God grows. This is part of the mystery of the kingdom of God. So when the grain is ripe, it wants to put the sickle because the harvest has come. And his friends, the image of the sickle being put forth for the harvest this, uh, symbolizes the arrival of the second coming of Jesus and the expression of the kingdom of God and that arrival comes with judgment. And Joel chapter 3 verse 13. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe, go in tread. For the white breath is full, the battle of woes, for their evil is great. And then so friends who understand that this parable is also getting at is also reminding us to pay attention. Because the kingdom of God is growing all around us and it is growing in those who want him more than anybody, anything else. Right? The kingdom of God grows in people who want the kingdom in their lives more than anything else. Which means that it's growing in people who want Jesus more than anything else, than anyone else, than any any tangible thing, intangible thing. That's where the kingdom of God grows. In people who want Jesus more than anything else. But what we also know is that it is through the church that God expresses his kingdom on earth. Which means that even though we may uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which means that even though people may look with their worldly eyes and the church may not seem like much, and it may not look like much. Jesus says, don't take my kingdom for granted because I decide how my kingdom will grow. And I think, and I think it's particularly heartbreaking to God and those who claim that they're part of God's family when they look upon the church with disdain I'll be honest with you, when I read this parable, I think of our church. Most of the time, we don't look like much. We aren't a big church. We don't have fancy programs and lights and smoke and mirrors and, <clears throat> and often people who call this their church home secretly and not so secretly wish that we were something else. And yet we forget what Jesus said. And Jesus said, I will build my church. And Jesus in this parable reminds us 
sense that there is an inevitability to the coming of his kingdom, which means that his kingdom will continue to grow in the hearts of those who have to be Which brings us to the last parable of the section, right, which is often called the parable of the mustard. And it's in this parable that Jesus pulls together a lot of the threads that he's been weaving uh, throughout this section of Scripture. Um, it's in this parable that Jesus reveals what's so important that can't be hidden or shouldn't be hidden under a basket or under the bed. Right? And what is then so profoundly shocking is that what Jesus said will change the whole uh, course of history. Right? And here is what he reveals in this parable. Jesus once again likens the kingdom of heaven to a feast, this time of a specific feast. Right? He, he's not just saying seed, he's actually giving a specific seed, a mustard seed. Right now, a mustard seed is a very small seed, but it's not the smallest seed. And so Jesus is using hyperbole here to make a point. The point is that the kingdom of God rises from insignificance and obscurity to become something so immense and glorious, not because of its strength and might, but because of its weakness. And we got to get this. The kingdom of God rises from obscurity and insignificance, not because of its strength, but because and through its weakness. And to the degree that we understand this is to the degree that we will be shaped by God to live with him forever. Friends, this, the secret of the mystery of the kingdom of God is that true power isn't derived from strength. True power is derived from weakness. This is the ultimate paradox, friends, of God's kingdom. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in 2 Corinthians 13, 4. He says, For he was crucified in what? In weakness, but lived by the power of God. Jesus, over and over again, keeps telling us that if you are going to think about God's kingdom in terms of the kingdom of the world, you will never, ever understand it. And if you're going to ascribe worldly values to the kingdom of heaven, you will always be in conflict with the kingdom of heaven. Yes. This is what makes Jesus so, his teaching, so profound, and at the same time, hard to stomach. There is a profoundness to this, when Jesus says things like, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus gives us the picture of the, of the kingdom of such depth and such magnitude that the only way that it can be entered is through a gate so narrow that if you don't follow Jesus through it, you will miss it. The only way through the narrow gate is to follow Jesus through it. You cannot follow Jesus. You will not follow. You will not find the narrow gate without Jesus. You must follow Jesus through it. Amen. If you don't, you'll miss it. Matthew 16, 24 to 27, that Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man who gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. You know why it's come? Jesus can say all this. He can say this because this is what he has done so that we can find the kingdom of God. Jesus made himself nothing so that we can find the kingdom of God. Jesus denied himself. Jesus is God. And this is why understanding the glory of God is so important, because this is who Jesus was. Jesus is God, and he gave up all of the comforts of heaven to come and dwell among sinful humanity in order to save us from our sin. Jesus lost his life so we could find ours. Jesus became so small that the kingdom of God could be made large not only in our lives, 
but so that it could be manifest here on earth through his church. Philippians 2, 5, 8. We read it off. Having been in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count his own life by something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and death. Jesus became the small seed so that when he died, his life would be multiplied exponentially through the line of the Lord. And the last three points that I want to make this morning is that the seed that becomes the tree bigger than all the other trees of the garden is a picture of the great tree uniting heaven to earth. Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 4. Right? I saw and beheld a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. The tree was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all the beasts of the field, and shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in the places, and all flesh was dead. Friends, Jesus Cross is the fulfillment of that dream. The cross of Jesus is the tree which unites heaven to earth once again. Because through Jesus' weakness, we are made whole if we choose to accept the incredible grace of God. Friends, the cross of Jesus Christ is the great world tree that once again unites heaven and earth. No longer separated. We were created to dwell with God. But we mucked it up there. We mucked it up bad. And heaven was separated from earth. Jesus on the cross united once again to heaven and earth. C.S. Lewis summarizes all of this in the final paragraph of his book called Mere Christianity. In it he says, The principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, and you will say, but submit to death. Death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will ever be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred. Loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find Him. And with Him, everything else goes in. Friends, if we're going to be Jesus' church, then we have to understand that this is how we must 